Hashem, to see him with me. Okay, so we're going to start uh, this week's parsha. These are the laws that you should put before them. And there's a lot of questions asked about this verse. Um, some of the questions are regarding what does it mean to place it in front of them. Yeah. You should place it in front of them. Means that it's uh, in the plural sense, before them. But the next, uh, the first law that we learn about, Eved Ivri, which is equal, something you'd like, you'd all like, but you'd like more than others. What? It's equal to Mashiach. Eved Ivri equals Mashiach. Okay. Oh, voila. Okay. And Eved Ivri, Sheshanim. Shazki tikne Eved Ivri, Sheshanim Yavod. So, Eved Ivri, Sheshanim is equal to 1,358. Because Sheshanim is equal to 1,000. Okay. And that's the value, Baruch Shen Kvod Machuto Olam Ved. So in Kabbalah, uh, everything really revolves around this gematria. It depends. The, the ones who knew this gematria, it wasn't, like very, wasn't very famous, but the people who knew this gematria, it was a, it was a big deal. So, Kitikne Eved Ivri should buy a, a Jewish servant. It says in the singular, Ulashon Yachid. Havel Elemei Marki Knut should have said, that he knew in the plural. If you just said place before them, so the first law should be in the plural as well. So why is it in the singular? So the Alter Rebbe's explanation is jaw dropping. It says it's not. You shouldn't understand even the pshat. It sounds like the pshat is this way. Don't understand it as when there's a sing when there's a single Jew who buys who purchases, who, who hires, if you want to call acquires. it that, acquires a Jewish servant, but rather the issue is Meaning that it's Moshe Rabbeinu who acquires the Jewish servant. Who's that? All of us? No. It's Moshe Rabbeinu. What do you mean all of us? I would say the Moshe Rabbeinu in all of us. But, but literally, he explains that the meaning of the first uh, verse is that Moshe Rabbeinu will place all the laws in front of us, but really it's not in front of us, because Lifneihem in Hebrew also means inside us, by acquiring each of us as a servant yeah, that's what I said. All of oh, us. So he that's acquires what you meant. All of us. He acquires all of us. Each one of us individually. So this is a tremendous explanation. The Moshe Rabbeinu has to acquire us. So right away we know that acquiring something is related both to an object, but the act of acquisition is related to the state of mind of the purchaser. In order to purchase, you have to be in a certain state of mind, halachically. For instance, if a person gave money to a, to a seller, he's, sell, he's selling him wheat. At least that's what he thinks he's selling him. And he, the purchaser, gives money on, 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 on the understanding that he's going to receive wheat. But the seller meant to sell him uh, barley. So there's no deal. Okay. Because uh, that's not what I meant. So acquisition requires consciousness of what you're acquiring. Consciousness is dot. And so this whole, uh, simple as it were, beginning of the laws of the Torah, talking about the various monetary laws, suddenly becomes something very critical in terms of the relationship between Moshe Rabbeinu as the giver of the Torah and the rest of the Jewish people, and what Moshe Rabbeinu does for us by giving us the Torah. That it's not just giving us, it's not giving us a textbook. If it was just giving us a textbook, theoretically, 
the Jewish people could find a book in the desert. And God says to them, this is what I want you to do. But it doesn't work that way. Because a book is only as good, well, today we know this. It's like a newspaper in the end. It's good for the day that it was written. If you want to make it into something that's lasting, so there has to be an interpretative um, mechanism for explaining it as the generations go on. For instance, um, when you look at the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution is, a, is an interesting document, but it's old. Does it really function in the time of internet and the time of having uh, instant access to this and to that? Should really, you know, the, the electoral college be the one that decides who the president is and not the people? All these questions that, you know, at, at the time they weren't questions because they were done, it was written a certain way to solve a certain problem. But some of those problems don't exist and there's new ones instead. If you want to have this document remain relevant, you have to have an interpretative mechanism. So in the United States, that's called the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court can interpret the document and fix it or explain it in a way that makes sense today. The same thing by the Torah, that the Torah is talking about donkeys and sheep, and it's talking about a Jewish servant and all these things that are not relevant now. How can you make it relevant? You have to have the mindset, the frame of mind of the giver of the Torah inside you somehow. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu does. Moshe Rabbeinu in each of us gives us the ability to interpret the Torah in such a way that when we learn it, it's relevant. But that's just the first step. That everybody understands. The Alter Rebbe is going to go a lot further. He's going to say that it's not just that Moshe Rabbeinu gives us the ability to interpret the Torah. He's going to say now that Moshe Rabbeinu gives us the ability to sense godliness in the world. And so that when we learn the Torah, we know how to apply it to the appearance of God in everyday life. So that everything becomes relevant. That, we might say, is a tremendous chiddush. It's not... It wasn't stated clearly before the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was the first one who said this. I think, I, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody who said it so clearly before him, that the Torah is relevant for every person, every time, and in every place. That, uh, me, that method of making the entire Torah universal is far more than just making it an interpretative. Because interpretative me, still means that, okay, but you know, a guy who's not engaged in, in buying a donkey, today buying a car, it's not, that law is not relevant to me. I'm not engaged in buying a servant, so what does that have to do with me? Ah, no, it does. It has everything to do with every single individual. Because when it comes to sensing godliness, the interpretation of the Torah is in such a way that it becomes relevant for everybody. And that's, that's what this essay is going to talk about. The Inektiv, it says, in Parshas Ekev, in Deuteronomy, I will give grass in the field for your animal. Who says this? He says it in the first person. It's not, it's not Hashem saying this. This is Moshe Rabbeinu saying this. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu says. I'm going to give you grass for your animal. Now, since we know Tanya a little, whenever it says in the Torah, your animal... Or your or the non-Jew, the goy, who's it talking about? It's talking about me. <laughs> it's talking about my goy. It's talking about my animal. And it's relevant to me. So, a guy who reads this and doesn't have a field, that doesn't have animals grazing, says, "How is this relevant to me?" It says, it says Chassidus, "Of course, it's relevant to you, because you have an animal. It's just that you don't know. And grass is not necessarily just grass. It's sustenance for your animal soul." And Moshe Rabbeinu, as a figure and as a symbol and as a continuous force in the world, is feeding, is giving sustenance, which is called grass, to your animal soul. So this is like the root, in a certain sense, of how the Tanya 
uh, starts out that every Jew has both an animal soul and a divine soul. But here it's much more than this, because he really wants to say that um, he really builds something that I think that Tanya he didn't say. He, he never he never really captured this sentiment, call it. Now, what is the real difference between the animal soul and the, and the divine soul? And that's one of the things he's going to, to capture here. And, and why Moshe Rabbeinu is so important. It says in Jeremiah chapter 31, I will seed the house of Israel with the seed of man and the seed of animals. Why? What does this mean? The seed of, uh, of man. Here it's very hard. To, uh, but again, this is not the Torah. It's, it's a prophet. So you understand that he's talking figuratively. So what does he mean? So the explanation is, There are two levels among the souls of Israel. Okay. So the, the souls themselves are divided into two types. The first type, They're the type of animals, they're the type of souls that are very high in their stature, and they're called the seed of man. Because all the souls are considered to be, uh, to have their origin in the divine chariot. And in the divine chariot, there first of all was the wheels, and then there's the axles, and then there's the chariot itself, or the chair as it's called. It's very interesting, chariot, I guess, and chair come from the same word. But finally, at the end, the whole thing of the chariot is for there to be somebody being transported on it and sitting on the throne. So there is a person there that Ezekiel sees. So these four levels, they correspond to the four worlds, from an emanation all the way down to action. And there are souls that come from the world, world of emanation, which is symbolized in the vision of the chariot by the figure sitting on the chair on the chariot. And so that's, they're called Zera Adam. They're called the seed of so man. Hashem is sitting on the chariot. No, it's not Hashem. <laughs> it's a figure. V'alak, he said, Mut Kemare Adam. That's what he says. The likeness of a man. The likeness of the form of a man. It's a picture of Yaakov Avinu on the side okay, of the chariot. Okay. Even the, that, that, that figure was, was like Yaakov. Yaakov is all the way through. Because he's Barea uh, Chatichon. Because he's the, the middle axis that goes all the way from top to bottom. Again, the figure here is what kind of face it had is, is irrelevant. Uh, if he looked like Joe, or he looked like uh, again, like Joseph, or he looked like uh, Jake, like Yaakov, not very, not not interesting physically because it's a vision. What it is interesting is who do you connect it to? Do you connect it with the symbol of Jacob? Or do you connect it with some other symbol? So it's usually connected with Jacob. That's the figure. Um, specifically, it says because it's the figure of a likeness of man, so it's also connected to Adam. From that, we learn. That Jacob's likeness is similar to Adam's likeness, but, it, but but again, that's also it's not to say that they look the same. Who saw them both next to one to, next to the other? We don't know what they looked like. We don't have pictures. They didn't have pictures. So the meaning is that uh, uh, in his time, J- Jacob served the same purpose as Adam did. And Adam, it says that he was 200 cubits high or 100 cubits high, depending on when when we meet him in, in the Medrash. Which comes to say that he was, he was spanning from top to bottom, from all the spiritual world, worlds, from above to below. Just like Jacob in his time, he spans from above to below. <laughs> These are the souls that are called the seed of man, or the souls that came from the man sitting, the form of the likeness of a man sitting on the, on the chariot. As it says, The same thing will make man in, his, in our image and in our likeness. So the form of an image or form of a likeness is the same thing. These are what we call the souls of emanation, of atzilus. They're called sons. In general, the relationship between them and God is one of being sons. What does it mean that they're a son? That, that, the, that the relationship cannot be severed. There's no, that's one thing. 
The other thing is what he begins the Tanya with in chapter 2, that the soul that's from uh, the world of emanation is always uh, is, 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 shares one-to-one the mind of God. It has the same abilities. Obviously not in capacity, but in, um, fu- but in functionality, what parts it has. So he says in the same way that um, a child receives all his intelligence from his parents, you can't give him a shot after he's born and increase his IQ. Not IQ is a bad word, but you can't increase his physical intelligence, what his mind is capable of. What, he, what it's capable of, it could be that it's infinite potential, but it received all that potential from the parents, didn't receive it from anywhere else. In the same way, the mind of a soul, the, the, the intellectual capacity, or in this case, as we'll see, the ability to perceive godliness, to sense, to sense God, to sense godliness in the world, is given entirely from God himself. Meaning they have the same capacity. As why are there the Everybody has one. That's why we say we all have a nefesh lokis. We all have a, a divine soul. But yeah, here he wants the nefesh lokis. Okay, okay. Divine soul is always from mitzvahs. Even even you and I, our divine soul is in emanation. Which is why it's having such a tough time with us, yeah. because we're way down somewhere. At least I am, very very low down. So this and is everybody is a part of Hashem. So that's what you mean when you say everybody is part of Hashem. Yeah. yeah, that's what you mean. Not only that, I think we talked about this in the past. There's only one real. There's really only one divine soul, and we all share it. So each of us has a different uh, application of it, as a manifestation, different aspect. But in the end, there's only one, just as Hashem is one. In any case. Here, in this verse, and what Jeremiah is saying, is not exactly the Tanya's theology, or his psychology. He's talking, uh, Jeremiah is talking about a much more um, sociological division between a tzaddik and a, and, a, and a simple person. That the tzaddik has his divine soul revealed and conscious, and you would say that his soul in general is the soul that came from the likeness of the form of man sitting on the chariot. And a regular person doesn't come from there. He comes from somewhere lower. And these souls, from the likeness of the form of man, they're called sons. And these souls, they come from the lower parts of the chariot, from the parts that can correspond to creation, formation, and action. They are called servants. I should probably switch sides. I don't know if it'll help, actually. Sorry. It won't help. No, I was thinking of having the sun in the other direction. You want to change? No, no, it's not going to matter, because the sun's already reached that side also. Okay. That's why in Rosh Hashanah we say, whether as, as children or as servants. Because these are called servants, the, lower, the, the souls from the lower three worlds. And just as there is a higher stature to man because he has consciousness, he has das, so these souls from emanation, from the form of the likeness of the man on top of the chariot, they have great consciousness of godliness. What does it mean to have consciousness? It's not just knowledge. We can't translate das here as just knowledge. But rather a sense, a feeling for godliness. They sense it in everything. Okay. So, I have to say something about this in general. Why, why is the Alter Rebbe going in such a... Call it at least surprising interpretation. So... Everybody in Chassidus who talks about Parshas Mishpatim, about this Parsha, can't ignore the fact that the Zohar starts, and the Zohar and Mishpatim starts, and right away goes into the issue of the, the, the section called Sabbath the Mishpatim. 
the grandfather of Mishpatim. There's a grandfather who shows, shows up. Always when there's a grandfather in the Zohar, and in the Talmud, it's usually considered to be Eliyahu. And he right away begins to talk about in incarnations. This part of the Zohar is very much into incarnations and into things. Now, the, there's the vulgar understanding of incarnations. The vulgar understanding, the, the colloquial, we we'll call it, of incarnations is that a person passes away and the soul comes back in another body. No. <laughs> now, I don't know if there is such a thing, isn't such a thing, but that's not the way that the Zohar explains it. And it's not the way that it was developed further by the, by the commentaries on the Zohar. And it's certainly not how it's seen in the Chassidus, as we'll see. Um, incarnation by the non-Jews might be that. And it was, you know, there's different theories about whether it's an originally Jewish thought or not an originally Jewish thought. Rasag, for instance, Rav Sadia Gaon, he felt that it was so foreign that it shouldn't be allowed into Yiddishkeit. It should be stamped out. So you see that it's not from the Zohar. It's at least, you know, Rasag was very aware of it. So he, he lived in 920 uh, CE. It's an, it's an ancient thing. And really, the Zohar traces it back to verses in Job and even to verses in, uh, in the Chumash. The first instance of incarnation seems to be very simply uh, Seth. Right? That he was named like that because Eve herself said, that, that was her sir, a third son, she herself said, God has given me, has built for me, shot, like to build, has built for me um, someone instead of Abel because he was killed by Cain. By Cain. So Seth becomes the first incarnation. It's very clear. He's, he's a, they felt that it was the same person. It wasn't just in place of. It was his name. He, he is. He is. Uh, <laughs> he is Abel. Abel came back. So this is. The, the, and I think as you get older, you, you tend to see that people are the same. <laughs> right, don't, you, don't you feel that? As you, as you get older, there's 50 types of people but approximately in the world. And, uh, I never really thought about it. And every person you meet, so they're, in the, they're a unique and individual in their own way. They sort of fit a certain... Uh, I've seen this guy before. Oh, there's different types of people. Yeah, so there's well, types. That doesn't mean they're the same person. So why are they... The, why are they again, by animals, it's very clear. Because animals are, are far less complex than humans. So you get, so you get the sense that the you know they they have their own quirks each one but in general you have a horse that's like this I'm not I'm not an expert on horses but I'm sure they have names for each type right? this one's like this this one's like that watch out for this guy he's like that uh, they categorize it because animals are very easy to categorize they're not very difficult um, when it comes to humans it's a lot more difficult because humans are very complex but that's their those are their quirks. But in terms of personality, it's pretty much, uh, <laughs> and people fit in also pretty easily. They, they, you know, they're drawn to, to fit into a certain stereotype. And everybody hates stereotypes because, of course, there's also the individual side to each person. But there's also this uh, thing that repeats. And when it comes to the divine soul, that's what I said before, that there's only one, we're really exactly all the same. Really, really, the divine soul is one. So godliness is really the same across the board. When you see godliness, you recognize it very easily. And it doesn't matter if the guy's, um, his prowess is in Gemara, his prowess is in doing tzedakah, his prowess is in davening, it doesn't matter. You, you see it, you recognize it right away. There's something very um, typical about it. So, so reincarnation has been around for a long time, since the first generation or second generation of mankind. But in Kabbalah, that's not what it means. Not at all. In Kabbalah, the understanding of reincarnation is 
that there are drops of, of sensible, meaning godliness that you can sense in everything that happens and everything that you encounter. And reincarnation is the ability to capture that godliness, and to, to sense it. That's what really, reincarnation is, is the same theory, in, in a sense, as the nitzotzot, as the sparks of godliness that are in different things. When the spark of God, think about it, what does it mean? That when you tell me that there was a world called the world of chaos, the world of Tov, and it shattered and broke, and the light in the that was trapped in the vessels of that world fell down into our reality, and now it's inside different things. And when you eat it, or you drink you it, elevate it, you elevate it. You, if you, make it you right. basically bring it back to life. If you make it right. So that's the reincarnation. Okay, if you make it right, you need, you can't just, things don't reincarnate by themselves. Okay, but reincarnation is really the, 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 something they call the transmutation of souls. So this is closer, but it's really the transport of divine energy from place to place. And there's divine energy in everything. So either you sense it or you don't. So you can get into the whole story of reincarnation, which is interesting in and of itself. And that's how it was described in the Zohar and the way that the Rizal describes it. Or you can see how the Alter Rebbe in Chassidus, in general, transmutes the, the concept of reincarnation instead of being this picture of things coming back to life, but rather turning it into this is the mechanism that underlies all divine energy in the world. Whenever divine energy is moving around, it's called reincarnation. So it's coming from me to you, you're taking it, you're making it more alive. And it, it, it's just everywhere. And then consciousness, the consciousness that Moshe Rabbeinu has, becomes awareness of this energy. Are you aware of it? Do you sense it or do you not? And so this morning we took a walk and we saw all kinds of things along the way. If the Baal Shem Tov was taking that walk, it would mean something completely different for him. To him, every single car that passed, every single person that we saw, every single cat that we saw, whatever, they're all expressions and movements of divine energy. And they all have meaning. For us, you and I, I assume also for you, unless you're hiding it, but these are not valuable in our service of God. We don't understand what but they mean. But you do sometimes see that. Ah, sometimes we're, we're so, it's so in our face that we get it. But that's really what's behind the idea that the Baal Shem Tov said that everything you see is a message of ungodliness. You can treat it as a message from God, in godliness, doesn't matter. But there's divine transfer of energy here all the time. So everything you're seeing has meaning. So something like the Baal Shem Tov was very sensitive to it, had knowledge of this reality. So everything meant something for him. Not just that it meant something, it also told him what was about to happen. And for us, it's another chance of event. We don't see it. We can't see it. In the same way that we're hard-pressed to decide whether, like, I saw the, your face a little bit, in spite of the sunlight. I saw your face a, a little uh, doubtful about this idea of there being certain types of people. And it's a new thing, because you're a very person person. <laughs> so you see that the difference between people. You, re you respect those differences, and that's how you communicate with people, which, which is absolutely the way it should be. But it's harder to take a step up and see it in a more categorized way. But beyond the differences in the world of action, in the world of formation, people are much more categorized. They're not so different. They think they're different because they're living in the world of action. That's where they feel that they're different because their body, one guy likes pecan ice cream, the other guy hates it. But that's the body, that's chemistry, that's, that's not really them. The higher up you go, the more you see that you're the same. The more you see that... 
אבל אצלנו... אבל אצלנו זה... כן, Ox, or you look like an eagle. Okay, that's the four faces in there? Okay, chariot. and those are the four faces in the chariot. Which part of the chariot? The part, not, the, not the wheels, or the ax are, the axles, but the wheels. And the wheels had four faces to them. So in the world of Yetzirah, the world of formation, there you have four faces. What's it trying to say? It's trying to say, look, buddy, if you go up a little higher, you'll see that people can be divided into different categories. They don't like it, but that's the way it is. Because we each love our individuality down here in the world of action. But as you go higher, it's all the same. Which is why we all put on tefillin, and it's the same tefillin. You don't have to... Can, there's a car company in China now called Canoe. So they're, big, they're a big hop, apart from being an electrical vehicle, because in China they don't know how to build a, a combustion engine. So their big hop is that you can... individualize every part of the exterior of your car so no more do you want it in this color we have eight colors metallic color is beautiful you can even do mix two colors match. mix and match them <laughs> from now on you can send them you can send them the pattern you want or not a pattern a picture and they'll make the exterior of the car exactly the way you want it So people love that. They're crazy about that. Because where are people living? They're living in the world of action. It's wonderful. Diversity is very good. But if you go just a little bit higher, in the end, they're all driving the same car. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> if they put this on the outside, they all have the same engine. They all have the same amount of battery life. They all have <laughs> go a little bit higher, they're all traveling on the same roads. Go a little bit higher than that, They're all running the same errands. They all have the same things in their, uh, uh, the same purpose in their lives. There's no real difference. Ah, you, it's individualized. You're right. There's a lot. You, you know people that I don't know, and, you, and you, you like these things, and I don't. And so, but as you go higher and higher, you see that it's categorized. It's really typical. So, again, people don't like stereotypes. But the person who sensed, who is... able to sense godliness they're able to see these interactions it starts out by seeing the generalizations if you can't do the generalizations we talked about this that all of Kabbalah and Hasidus is about being able to generalize to understand the trope the general symbol that's hiding behind things and then obviously you know because it's, it's like science you It took us a long time to come to four basic physical laws. But the moment that we came to them, so everything that's happening is just some manifestation of these particular laws. So almost every single interaction like this, when I make a sound, is the law of electromagnetics. And it's the electromagnetic force. It can all be described using electromagnetism from beginning to end. And then there's gravity and there's a strong force, weak force, but they're very uncommon in our lives. Gravity is... somewhat present because we all stand up but in general everything is electromagnetism it doesn't take away from the fact that there are a million different interactions happening every second right around me in me my interaction with the but in the end it can all be explained using one law in a certain sense that's what happens with being sensitive to godliness that the more the person is sensitive and <clears throat> the more he sees the interactions and As types of interactions and he can read them he, under, he can understand in the same way that when I hear this because I'm sensitive to sound I understand that something hit something so that person when he sees something that I'm not even aware of a certain movement made by a person a certain um, change in the clouds and different things that are happening they mean something to them okay? 
they're, they're, they're godliness. So those are, that's what's called having a sense, having a hargasha. And he will explain it further later on. And this is how it's all connected to Mishpatim. Because again, in Chassidus, the notion of reincarnation is, is, is sublimized, is sublimated. And it becomes that reincarnation is the general um, mechanism for all divine energy transfer in the world. And that's why it's related to this parsha again, because the Zohar begins with the Saba de Mishpatim, with this part that talks about reincarnations. And in Chassidus, it's taken to its extreme, which is not to talk about the specific incarnations of this person, that soul, whatever, but rather as all the divine transfer of energy, all the transfer of divine energy in the world. And <clears throat> the second type of soul is what we call the souls of animals. Like we said, the lower souls. Which is most of the souls, almost all of the souls in our generations. <clears throat> because the souls of Atilus are what we call elevated souls. They rise up and they are few. Even in the early generations, there were few. And these, the, the majority of the souls, like us, we don't have so much sense of godliness. We don't sense these transfers of energy. Don't mistake this, he says, for intellect and godliness. That's not the same thing. Because we can study this mimer, we can learn this, what we're learning now, and we have a very good sense of we, we have sorry, very good intellectual understanding of what he's saying. So we can understand godliness, but that's not the same thing as sensing godliness. Two different things. Hela, <clears throat> but rather, gam shi yeshlem sechel vasaga. Even though, even when we have <clears throat> some ability. Even when we have some intellectual grasp of godliness, we can learn Tanya, we can learn Chassidus, we can learn Kabbalah, we can learn many things. And we understand the greatness of God from books and even from teachers. And we understand that God is the life force of everything. And there's no... Um, no, no end to his greatness. But we can't sense it. We understand it, but we don't see it. We can't sense it. How can you understand it and not sense it? Oh, glad you asked that question. It's almost like I paid you. Hmm? I'm glad you asked that question. It's almost like I paid you to, to, to ask that question. Okay. So how can you understand something but not be able to sense it? Exact same thing with electricity. We have no idea. We have no a human being has no ability to sense electricity. What we can sense is a lot of current, <laughs> but when we sense it, it's too late. <laughs> you can't use your fingers to build an electronic circuit. You have to have. You can't do that. I know there's people who try to do it at home. Don't do this at home. You need to scope, you need a oscilloscope, you need a, a voltmeter, you need, and yet, we understand perfectly how to, how to build them. We do it wonderfully. We cannot sense for our lives, okay, no matter what we do, ultraviolet radiation, or infrared radiation, or any type of radiation except for the visible spectrum. Well, ultraviolet, we sort of can because it heats up our hands, but it's not... That's not what we're talking about. We, we don't know what to... We, we can't sense it, yet we know exactly how to use it. So there's a variety of areas in which we have an understanding but no ability to sense. There's many, many areas. That's the greatness of the human mind, that we can understand far beyond our experience. But because we can understand far beyond our experience, we also make mistakes, because we assume we understand. And sometimes we're wrong. So let me give you an example. For yeah. example, right? Somebody phoned me up. Maisha Sahoya. 
They're not stum, a figment of my imagination. Somebody phoned me up, things are very bad, I have no money, I'm desperate, I've got to pay some bills, I need 500 shekels. A long time ago, 500 shekels then was a lot of money. It was money. actually money. Right. I had zero money in the camera. I said to him, you have some money, I'll give it to you. He says, you know, um, it's quite serious, quite difficult, no problem. So an hour later, or two hours later, I'm walking from my house to the shul in Ramadala. I'm outside Pinchas's Makolit, and a bus stops. <laughs> a bus on the other side of the road, and it stops. Now, usually buses don't stop in the middle of nowhere. You know, there's cars moving. <laughs> and the window opens, and the driver calls out, Cat, I need you, come here. So I didn't know there were any bus drivers that knew me personally. So I need you to hoof, come here. So it's a guy, actually, you know him. Menachem. Yeah, he told you the story? No, I'm guessing. Yeah. He says, I'm searching for you everywhere. <laughs> I said, what's the problem? He says, I've got some mice of guilt, and I've got to get rid of it. And I'm looking for it's burning everywhere. a hole in my pocket. It's burning a hole in my shirt. <laughs> and, and please, can you take it? Because I couldn't find you in the phone. How much do you want to give me? Five hundred shekels. Right? So that you need to say when that happens, you don't see a shell? No, you do. He didn't say you, you don't see a shell, right? But you don't. But it, it's not just. But that's sense. because it was in your face. It was like a punch in your face. Okay, so therefore you can like I see said, and sense a shell. Electricity. Yeah. If you if you if you take a hundred amps through you, you'll feel. <laughs> okay. But take five hundred microamps, you won't feel anything. Say, but on a smaller scale. So most of the things that are happening on are on a smaller a scale. If a person is tuned in, right. if a person is aware, huh. right, I could explain to you, I'll pick up all that and I'll take the seat this way. You're sitting there and I'm sitting here. Uh -huh. And why that bird's are and it's... The person in our generation that did this the most, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, was uh, Reva's father, who openly explained. So in his he has, a, he has a whole biography, autobiography of himself, where he explains everything that happened to him and what it meant, and who it's connected to, and a Gilgal of what is this, and this and that, and all these things. You don't know about the ribbies for bringing in Paris? So, uh, also, once in a while, there's uh, other people that do it uh, no, openly. Where, where, where he took everybody okay. one by one and said, what's your name, and that's where you're sitting here, and that's where you're sitting here. Okay. So again, the, uh, there are some souls that are that sensitive, and most of us get 100 amps once in a while. Five, ten times a year. I don't know how many times. But we're not sensitive to it. Because the shock us... But you can tune yourself in to become yeah. sensitive. Maybe you can, maybe you can. That's the, the, whole, the whole purpose of this mimer is to understand what Moshe Rabbeinu gives you. And what the Tzadi gives you. And why, why you're walking, in a certain sense, blindly through the world. But it's okay, because you don't need to know. Maybe you wouldn't even want to know. Okay. It might even be that you wouldn't want to know everything that they know. Okay, to be continued tomorrow.